Hello, everyone. I'm Rania Kalik, and this is Dispatches. In February of this year, the Chinese government celebrated the eradication of extreme poverty within its borders. Now, this would be a massive achievement for any country, but for China, even more so, as it's home to some 1.4 billion people and is considered a developing country. China's credited with lifting over 800 million people out of poverty, which accounts for 70% of the world's total poverty reduction. This is a massive feat, and it's worth understanding how China did it. To do just that, I'm joined by Ting's Chak, a researcher at the Tricontinental Institute, a member of the Dengsheng News Collective, and she's the lead author of a report titled Serve the People, the Eradication of Extreme Poverty in China, which everyone can go check out at the Tricontinental website. Ting's welcome. Thank you, Rania. So glad to be here. I'm so glad to have you on to talk about this. It's such a huge story, but just a quick reminder for those who are watching uh, that you can also listen to every episode of Rania Kalik Dispatches anywhere you get podcasts. Uh, And for those who are listening, you can watch every episode on the Breakthrough News YouTube page. Be sure to subscribe. Now for the topic at hand. I'm so excited to have you on to talk about this report in particular uh, because it's so comprehensive. Um, As you know, of course, it not only includes facts and figures, but you guys provided this deep analysis of the poverty alleviation program in China, how it worked, why it worked. And you incorporated on the ground field research and interviews with experts, which is just so incredibly fascinating. And I really do encourage those who are watching and listening to go actually read the report. But for those who are watching and listening, um, I don't think people in the West really grasp just how huge it is that China managed to eradicate extreme poverty. So just to start off, can you give our listeners and viewers a brief overview of what this actually means in practical terms? Like, how do you define poverty, extreme poverty, and what does it mean to be lifted out of it? And then we can go from there. Thanks, Rania. I think that's a great way to get us started. Maybe I can start with the story because I quite like stories. And ultimately, this is about, you know, people's stories of you know, real people will get lifted out of poverty. And I, I got to meet one person in the process of doing this study. Her name is He Ying, and she's herself a poor peasant from the countryside in the southwestern province of Weizhou, which is historically quite a poor, uh, very ethnically diverse region of the country. So she, um, we walked around with her for a day. She's now uh, a, a leader of the Communist Party of China, Uh, in the local chapter, as well as of the Women's Federation in her community. And so her day looks like she she wakes up at 7.30 in the morning. Mm -hmm. Um, She drops off her kid at school, um, which is five minute walk away. Uh, She lives in the community where she is also one of the leaders of, uh, one of the 12 leaders of, of 18,000 people. Uh, In that community, there are three uh, medical centers. There's a childcare center, there's a uh, primary school, middle school, um, and and also right next door is where her mother-in-law lives, uh, and her um, as well as her brothers and sisters and and um, nephews and nieces. So just to get a sense, her life now looks like this. Um, but just a few years ago, that walk just to drop her kid off to school might have taken her about two hours each way, just walking. Um, a uh, community health clinic or at the nearest hospital might be, you know, a day's ride away on, on buses plus walking. And now she lives in a community where those things are accessible to her. So in practical terms with someone for her life, it is actually accessing those material things and being able to live in a, in a community um, that, that where her kids and her mother and her mother-in-law can thrive. She says, I live upstairs, I work downstairs, and, you know, um, there's kind of three generations together. So that's a kind of story quite typical of what you might hear of someone's experience that in the process of like lifting themselves out of poverty become also you know leaders and protagonists in the process um and um stepping back a bit in terms of um how someone like her is defined to have lived in poverty and get lifted as you asked um the program has a slogan because here public policy often likes to use slogans with you know, kind of catchy phrases. So it's one income, two assurances, and three guarantees. Uh, What that is, is the first is income. 
-hmm. obviously that's still the the primary measure uh how a a person is doing you know their income sources do they have work so in china the extreme poverty level is set at the equivalent of two uh dollars and 30 cents a day um and this is just so that you know the world bank uses a dollar and 90 cents per day so the china standard is actually a bit higher than that um but the chinese um uh, approach wasn't just around income alone. I think what's more important to focus is these two other aspects I mentioned, the two assurances, which is that you don't have to worry about food and clothing, and then the three guarantees, which is that you are provided um, basic medical services, free and compulsory education, which in China is nine years, uh, and then safe housing. And, and they define safe housing as not only the structure of the housing, but that it has uh, safe uh, drinking water as well as electricity. So the actual program itself followed a what's called a multi-dimensional approach to looking at poverty. It's not just about handing out money and it's not just about your income, but actually kind of the various facets about what produces poverty and what maintains pro poverty. Uh, so according to this um, metrics, you know, the one income, two assurances, three guarantees, uh, the last 100 million people were lifted out of extreme poverty in the last eight years. And that, as you mentioned in the figure of 800 million, that's the last hundred of that 850 million people and just to get a sense of what that scale what that number means i mean almost seems too big to understand it's yeah. um it's the equivalent of lifting up the latin america plus the caribbean and most of the u.s combined together it would be if all of that population was living in extreme <laughs> poverty that was lifted and so globally in this last four decades um china's poverty eradication um programs actually lifted 76% of the world's uh, poor. So contributed 76% yeah. of the global reduction poverty. Um, so yeah. it's been a, it's quite a historic feat, I guess, not only for China, but for really the world to pay attention to. Yeah, it, it really is incredible when you think of the sheer numbers. And as far as, you know, as far as I can tell, just by what you just described, China appears to be or have done something really unprecedented in human history. And it's the way from what you describe in the report, you know, it's not only redirecting resources from wealthier parts of the country to poorer ones, but also what was so amazing was uh, how they conducted these like household studies and actually mobilized millions of members of the Communist Party to go to these neglected and disenfranchised and remote parts of the country and and work on elevating the standard of living there. And this is something that you mentioned in the report. It's just some more numbers for people, but it's just so staggering. I feel like people should hear it. The Chinese Communist Party or the CC, CPC, ha, or sorry, the Chinese Communist Party, the CCP, has more than 95.1 million members. That's a huge number. And as you note in the report, if the Chinese Communist Party were a country, it would be the 16th most populist in the world. Um, and 3 million of those members, as you referenced in the report, were actually dispatched to these poorer areas, mostly in the countryside. And you also note that over a thousand of them actually lost their lives uh, in those po like poor conditions that they went to go work to, to help elevate. So that said, can you describe the process of this and what the members of the party who went to these places what they went there to actually do, were they paid for it? Like, how were they incentivized to go? And was it effective? And I guess the answer to that would be yes, but you can explain how. I mean, I, th I think that's one of the most, I think, key key, key parts of this program that really impressed us as we were working in, on this report um, is just how much the success of it was based off of the, not only the, the CPC's ability to mobilize like a, whole of society, but also its party members and to go into the grassroots to do the base um, base building uh, mobilization work. So in it, so with that definition I, I mentioned, you know, you now know how to define extreme poverty in the country. You need to figure out in a country of 1.4 billion who the poor are, where they live, what are their actual conditions, and then begin a plan of, uh, of lifting and helping them lift themselves out of poverty. So initially in 2014, uh, 800,000 party members were sent to do that initial household survey like you mentioned. So that's literally going to the countryside, uh, a total of 132,000 uh, uh, villages and counties and knocking 
on households to figure out each family's income sources. What is their education level? What are the conditions of the housing, uh, like health conditions? And from there, they were able to identify that 100 million people and put it into a national database of uh, people who actually registered in the program. That's the initial phase of identification. Then, as you mentioned, the 3 million people who were sent, of course, they're full-time party cadre. They were carefully selected members, usually with some sort of, um, you know, a higher education or some specialization, whether it's in agriculture or in engineering or something that could be useful in the process. Um, and they go and live in these communities for one to three years uh, at a time, full time. And, you know, even visiting home uh, can be difficult times because they're fully, you know, dispatched to the villages. And we, we also met with a couple of these uh, cadres that were actually involved in, and you see what the daily life looks like. You know, um, the cell phone is constantly ringing. Uh, usually uh, each uh, cadre is actually assigned to one household. And then, uh, the, then these cadres make up a team uh, and each village is assigned a team. And the team is made of not only, not only the people who's dispatched, but also obviously local leaders, uh, local officials, community um, leaders as well, together they form a team that basically follow uh, the progress of, um, of everyone in the village, including those who are specifically registered in the program. Um, and so their basic work is, I mean, it's, it's the, for anyone who's ever done any kind of community organizing work, it's that day-to-day -day stuff. Um, it's, you know, Mr. Wong saying, oh, um, come here, uh, my front door lock is not is broken. Um, can you come help me fix it? Or it's Mrs. Zhang's son, he's not going to school and she's worried about it. So can you please come over and talk to him and, and like tell him why education is important and can you help us out there? Could be someone's aunt is sick or you know someone's father lost a job. Um, and so that's the kind of daily role that people were playing. Uh, in addition to creating those plans or helping the families come up with plans to figure out how they can be lifted out of poverty, whether it's through you know, employment, through creating agricultural production, creating you know access to markets, a variety of ways that can happen. Um, and one thing that's quite interesting is that uh, I don't want to give the impression is that just cadres get to you know dispatched and sort of tell the villagers what to do. There's quite a lot of decentralization and sort of democratic processes that actually happen in the villages. So I'll give one example is that there's these, what they call the democratic appraisal meetings uh, where the community comes together, the villagers, and they actually discuss the conditions of each family. And this is how they sort of also assess if someone should be registered in, in, as a poor family in the program officially, if someone has been successfully lifted out of poverty, if someone has maybe fallen back into poverty. Uh, and that as actually neighbors assessing each other's situations. And sometimes it can be tense too. It's someone saying, oh, you know, my neighbor is actually hiding three goats and he didn't report his income from that or that, you know, his son's actually sending him some remittances and he didn't report that. It's, it's a whole process, I mean, of, you know, village life that people participate in. Um, and that's why I think we also, in writing this report, was also stressing how much the participation and the, and the centering of uh, peasants in their own process of lifting themselves out of poverty was key. Um, it wasn't just sort of the government uh, coming in and swooping in and saying, okay, now we know what to do here. It's actually working with the, the villagers, community members themselves in the process. Yeah, it was. it's quite incredible the way that you described it. And then I go and think back about the way that this kind of stuff has been described in U.S. media over the last couple of decades. And it's always in this really like malicious way, like, oh, my God, China's going in and like forcing people to live in better houses. Like that's actually something that it gets complained about. I still remember an article in like the L.A. Times being like people were relocated to better housing, but they're really upset about it. And they were like, China's relocating people. It's demographic engineering. But the other thing mm -hmm. that was really interesting that you referenced in the report is this kind of cooperation between different geographic locations and the way that the government kind of like got industry to get involved. Um, so can you describe that a little bit like briefly the sort of the geographical cooperation, uh, including through industry and its, and its importance and kind of like being used in cooperation with the government to, to help this process along? Yeah, sure. I mean, so one of the um, things we focus in on is there are five core methods of how um, um, the 
people, the program worked in terms of really figure out ways to lift people out of poverty. The first one primarily is around industry. You have to create uh, economic opportunities. You have to be able to uh, develop the countryside as well as create jobs. I mean, frankly, just create sources of income. Uh, and that could often mean trying to connect, um, um, you know, rural producers uh, and develop their uh, productive capacity, you know, whether it's around an agricultural cooperative or um, seeking, figuring out how to get either public funds or even private uh, funds from like a, a partnering a state owned ent enterprise or a private enterprise to invest in, in these villages. Um, and one of the ways, as you mentioned, is getting the poor region, the richer regions to pair with the poor regions. When I say richer, I mean the more industrialized. In, in China, it's really the Eastern coastal part that if, since the reform and opening up period, has been prioritized industrial development. So there's this, what's called the East-West cooperation, um, where these regions, especially particular cities, are actually paired with like a sister city and a lesser developed interior, western, central region of the country, uh, a, a city from that side. So where we went, uh, where I mentioned in Guizhou in the province, is a specific city called Tongren, which is a, a fourth tier city um uh kind of still very much economically developing city it was paired with uh suzhou and jiangsu in uh, the the eastern region which is much more developed an economic hub of the region of east eastern part and how they actually did it was quite interesting it's um mobilizing uh, uh hundreds of these enterprises whether it's state enterprises or private enterprises to invest uh, directly in developing, uh, it could be local factories, it could be agricultural production, it could be a variety of sectors, also a lot of uh, uh, tourism, ecological tourism, and um, that's the incentivization. But beyond just the capital injection, it's uh, quite a thorough mechanism of exchanging know-how, exchanging um, uh, oftentimes technical professionals, it could be educators, it could be even government officials and cadres that get sent. In that process, thousands of people were actually sort of exchanged between the two places so they can actually learn uh, from the processes of uh, a more economically developed uh, region, uh, including the deputy mayor of Tongren, the city, the third, uh, this fourth tier city in Guizhou, the, that actually came and was sent there for years from Jiangsu to be able to oversee the process of uh, poverty alleviation, but in the integrated into the local governing uh, systems. And you see that across um, many kinds of um, uh, structures uh, to incentivize these programs. So, um, and then, so industry is the big way. So how do you get uh, investments for that? But then there's other aspects too. It's um, uh, what's called ecological compensation. It's quite interesting because, I mean, it's not not a surprise to anyone that the, the rapid economic development when China was really trying to develop its productive forces quickly um, meant that it came at a cost to the environment. I mean, mm. I live in one of the big cities in Shanghai and it's improved a lot, but you know, things like air pollution, water pollution, um, there's been serious damages to become the factory of the world to the local environment. So one of the programs has been, you know, uh, uh, how to restore the environment, uh, huge efforts around you know, tree planting and, and many quite impressive things that have been done, you know, um, trying to basically make green uh, deserts. And in that process, they also try to work with hiring people back in to work as forest rangers, tree planters, you know, managers of the forest um, and local ecological environment. And beyond that, there's also aspects to education and training, which has always been key in China to kind of figure out as a key means to lift people out of poverty. Um, and then there's also um, uh, relocation, as you mentioned, which is a very small percentage, actually, just about 10% of people who re relocated to new settlements. They lived in places that were just too harsh to live in, too prone to natural disasters, too remote. And this really does happen. I mean, China is a vast country, and there's many places that um, you, you can't resolve through development or injection of capital, let's say. And yeah. then finally, who can't work the fifth method is those um who who are the elderly have disabilities um there's social assistance you know you have to have some kind of social safety for those who who don't fall into the other categories of poverty alleviation yeah it's uh pretty incredible because when you compare it to the kinds of um fixes that 
that countries like America come up with when it comes to dealing with poverty. It's always these very like corporate kind of fixes where you like incentivize young people. Like we'll get rid of some of your student debt if you go teach in like a really impoverished area for two years, which like in the long term doesn't actually do anything good and really just ends up helping. Like it, it really ends up being like a part of a privatization scheme for, for schools. And the reason I, the reason I bring that, like, that up to compare it to this is you mentioned in the report how important it is to understand this as a part of socialism. Um, and that's right what differentiates a program like this to poverty alleviation programs, the ones that do, few that do exist in like capitalist Western countries, um, is what's at the foundational basis of them. And a part of it, and kind of like happening in conjunction with this, it's not necessarily a part of poverty alleviation, though it, it is a part of reducing inequality, is as I understand it at least, you know, the Chinese are also imposing what Western outlets will refer to as like harsh regulations upon billionaires and corporations, right? And they're doing this to, yeah, I know, oh no, right? Like it's so terrible, these horrible, restrictive, tyrannical regulations on billionaires. Um, to, but it, it's all in order to improve the conditions of workers and, you know, support small businesses. And also like I saw the New York Times recently, like went after big tech or went after China for going after big tech. Like, oh my God, China's like going after the big tech CEOs and trying to regulate them. Like it's something really awful that we should be afraid of. But um, I, I, the reason I raise this is I'm wondering if you could maybe discuss a little bit of, of what China is doing in terms of regulation with these bigger businesses and with these billionaires, uh, with that US, the US media is always freaking out about. I mean, I think one of the recent freakouts is kind of tangentially related, but they were freaking out about China's new regulations on children gaming. <laughs> where they were like, children can't game any more than three hours a day, which by the way is a lot of time to like be gaming. Um, and American media, like American journalists were freaking out about it. Like that's a bad thing. But anyways, um, can you talk a little bit about, about those regulations? Sure. I mean, it's almost hard to know where to start. <laughs> it's so juicy, you know, like living here, it's like every day you wake up, it's like, which billionaire now, you know? <laughs> that's exciting. That's a, that's like something I'd, I'd be, en I, people should be envious of that unless they're billionaires, in which case, yeah, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I mean, it's a, I mean, it's not actually, this question is useful because it's not unrelated to sort of the next phase or one of the strategic goals that China has after eliminating extreme poverty. That's just the starting step. I mean, now it's the whole idea of common prosperity is that, well, it's about distribution of wealth. It's about addressing the inequalities that have have really appeared during the period of rapid economic growth, you know, um, between rural and urban, between East and West, like the regions that we talked about, uh, between the rich and the poor. And so when we look at what's been happening uh, uh, in terms of clamping down on the, let's say that most, the farthest excesses of capital. Um, yes, China is a country with, it's not a capitalist country, but as a country with many capitalists, um, but it's a it's a way of reeling in, let's say, some of those excesses. And of course, I mean, it began with looking at big tech uh, and particularly around a lot of the uh, anti uh, the monopolistic practices. Um, I mean, we look at what happened. I think it really set off many of the. Um, you know, the kind of, I think the Western media alerts uh, when Jack Ma's Alibaba and Ant Group last year uh, was about to uh, uh, engage in the largest uh, initial public offering in the Hong Kong Shanghai stock exchanges. And it was supposed to be the largest one ever in the history of capitalism. Mm -hmm. uh, and just days before uh, China comes in and says, no, um, we're not gonna allow you to do it. And why? And but afterwards it comes in a slew of looking at how they were really look uh, their monopolistic practices, uh, predatory lending that way they were doing, they were entering in the sectors of FinTech, financial technical services, which is essentially working like a bank without the, the restrictions of a bank, without the regulations of a bank. Um, just to give you a sense of scale of just like, you know, the Jack Ma empire is Alipay. I mean, it's, you know, what we use to pay everything here on cell phones here, because basically cashless society. Um, uh, had something like 17 trillion US dollars of transactions last year. It's like the way we pay for stuff online, but or shop, whatever. That's more than the Chinese GDP, national GDP. So Jesus. these are mega, mega big tech companies 
And of course, what do they have? They have things like data, you know, you know data controls. I mean, this is a, a concern actually for everyone in the world. How we handle big tech is the, you know, um, biggest question of our times. Uh, I remember even the Guardian a few months ago published this um, survey about, uh, I think it's like most of global North countries about what are the biggest questions that people have right now, the biggest concerns of people. Number one, big tech. Number two, economic inequality. And guess what? These are two key objectives now that we're seeing behind this sort of, you know, reining in the billionaires and the big capital. Um, it's in the interest of the people, but we're seeing it a lot in every sector. I mean, we could spend hours talking about it, like how they're how they're doing the same with private education. Mm -hmm. um, you know, because they said, okay, uh, education has been hijacked by capital. That's what the government actually said. So we have to take it back and hijack it from capital and put it back into the public hands. So now, you know, private tutoring services that were trying to help kids, you know, catch up or get ahead of the curriculum. Now they said it has to be nonprofit. Mm -hmm. It can't be foreign invested. They can't be listed on stock exchanges because education is a public good. So it should not be something that is highly speculated upon and highly profited off of. Uh, and so, yeah, we have actually seen billionaires personally losing, I think, um, of what is it, Tal Education, one of the biggest companies here, have lost something like up to 90% of their personal wealth. He's still a billionaire, so don't worry <laughs> about it. But I mean, this is, yeah, I mean, the billionaires yeah. are... Like, I'm supposed to feel bad for that or something, too, by the way. Like, oh, no, I, I would love for Jeff Bezos to lose a significant portion of his personal wealth that he doesn't need uh, so that we can have, like, a better functioning society where people have access to basic things like education. Um, but on that note, you know, I one reason I think that the, the poverty alleviation program is such a huge achievement is also because of where the country started out with this process, which was, like, very low on the totem pole. So... Can you take us through some of the history of China before the founding of the People's Republic in 1949 and kind of give our listeners and viewers an idea of what, what it is that China had to endure in the period known as the century of humiliation and how that impacted people economically, how it impacted class formation and poverty? Because we're not talking about just any country doing poverty alleviation. We're talking about a country that started out with the vast majority of people being peasants, and that was for a reason. So can you go into some of that history? Yeah, I mean, I think that's that's a really important point. And this is also one of the aspects we wanted to stress in the study, is that it's really not just looking at the last 40 years or even the last eight years, but it's actually a process of the since 1949 of eradicating poverty where the vast majority were extremely poor and extremely poor because of as you mentioned, a century of humiliation. And what's that? I mean, um, it just to, let's, okay, I, let's say, okay, uh, shortly after the PRC was founded, um, mm -hmm. you know, Mao Zedong famously said, okay, now the Chinese people have stood up. And we have to think, well, what were they standing up from? Like, what was, hap what happened prior to that? We go back a hundred years, uh, uh, we go to the opium wars led by the, you, you know, uh, uh, the UK, the Britain, and also China was actually subjected to all kinds of uh, imperialist intervention. And uh, it was a semi-colonial state, including the city that I was born in in Hong Kong was actually ceded to the British and was only returned in 1997. That's like about 150 years of colonialism. But not only that, there was the whole section of Japanese imperialism, fascism that China was up against. During that, you know, what is in the West is called World War II, here it's a much longer history. I mean, here it's a 14 year uh, occupation. Um, there were 30 million Chinese lives lost in that, that, um, that occupation that we never hear about in the kind of history, Western version of World War II, which really just focuses on the European front. Mm -hmm. um, but that aside, um, we have also internal processes, you know, of uh, warlordism, feudalism, uh, we have uh, an, a civil war between the Nationalist Party uh, against the CPC. And what we saw was actually within that century of humiliation, China went from being the biggest global economy, which had about a third of the global GDP mm -hmm. uh, at the beginning of the 19th century, to just 5% when the PRC was founded in 1949. So you can see that, you know, from just economic terms, what the cost of colonialism, 
fascism, imperialism, and feudalism <laughs> had cost actually the country. So the country was extremely poor. It by GDP per capita standards, China was the 11th poorest country in the world in 1949. There were two Asian countries and eight African countries that were poorer than China. Wow. So this was where China was founded upon. And, and to think of this longer sort of seven decade trajectory is what I think makes it more impressive that we can say today pov uh, extreme poverty is, has been eradica eradicated in the country. Of course, the goal is, of course, getting to the next levels of you know, relative poverty or just elimination of all forms of poverty, but that's that's in the next phase. But it's pretty pretty impressive to to look at at that historical arc. I mean, I met someone. Um, uh, actually, it was Ho Ying's mom uh, who was to open um, this conversation with. She's just basically born around the time of the uh, of the revolution. So, in her lifetime, so just to give you a sense. I'll give you this idea. When she was born, when the PRC was founded, pretty much when she was born, her life expectancy, like every other Chinese person, was about 35 years old. She's like 70 My years God. old now. Their, her lifetime has doubled in her lifetime, and she is expected to live another 10 years according to um, the life expectancy here. So this is still within the lifetime of a person who was living today to actually witness what is the process, and that's why you have to put in the Kind of the process of socialist construction you know in this mm -hmm. kind of long project of building socialism that poverty of course is one of the key uh kind of stepping stones of and i mean that's amazing 35 so that's like me i'm 35 that's my that that was <laughs> me too we're the <laughs> same age yeah. <laughs> this is like we've made it this is the life this was like that's crazy to think about that being the life expectancy and so that said you know i think it's really important also and again you i love that you stress this in the in the report um you know, if we could go back in time for a bit from the years of, of 1949 with the founding of the People's Republic to 1976 under Mao, you know, in the West, we're only ever taught that this was like a very negative period. It was very brutal and harsh and, you know, people were killed and it was just awful and, you know, Mao is evil. But in the report, you explain what was actually accomplished during that time and that you can't separate it from the poverty alleviation that took place up until today. And in the report, you write, and I'm quoting, China, and this is about life expectancy, so I'm glad you brought that up. You write, China's life expectancy increased by 32 years. In other words, for every year after the revolution, more than one year was added to the life of an average Chinese person. In 1949, the country's population was 80% illiterate, which, is less than, which in less than three decades was reduced to 16.4% in urban areas and 34.7% in rural areas. The enrollment of school-age children increased from 20 to 90%, and the number of hospitals tripled. I mean, that's incredible. That's that's that alone is incredible. And we're just talking about the first couple, you know, few decades. So, how was that achieved? And you know, what other positives can be highlighted from this time period that we in the West are so are told to like demonize? I mean, we have to understand. Not only was China uh, quite poor, you know, uh, it it went into just three years after its formation, it already went in to um, uh, defend uh, the Korean people against the, the US-led right. aggression against the Korean people. Um, so, and of course, after that point, you know, it was subject to all kinds of sanctions. Um, it was very, I mean, this is the same story that happens to get day, you know, you don't have to repeat, but basically what, 30% of the countries in the world have uh, some kind of sanctions, unilateral right. sanctions by the US. Um, uh, the so, gift that keeps on giving. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> so it was very isolated. But even within that, we have to look at yeah, the when you measure per you know kind of a economic standard of a per capita GDP um, standard, China was still very poor. But under the you know the early socialist period, as you mentioned, things like healthcare, education, even women's rights uh, or women's participation in society was a huge one. I mean, just. As one other example, in 1950, the marriage law, one of the first uh, laws that was enacted by the PRC was this marriage law that looked at this basically centuries long of feudal patriarchal marriages and then ending a lot of the most brutal practices, which is child marriage, arranged marriages, uh, banned polygamy that was only allowed for men, uh, and 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 allow and also mandated the actual registration of um, of uh, marriages that also allowed women to to 
be human beings, you know, as individuals, yeah. human beings, but also a possibility to exit divorce, to leave their, uh, their, you know, possibly abusive or whatever marriages they were in. So that's, I mean, one of the first things that ex was experienced in, under the PRC. Um, but um, we have to look at literacy, especially, I mean, those numbers are across the board that you just mentioned, 80% illiterate. But when you look at women, it was uh, over 90% in the founding of the PRC. Today, it's 95% literacy. It's one of the most literate countries. Um, so if we look at it, the measure of, you know, like say the a poor peasant woman as a good metrics of actually what poverty reduction looks like, and I think it's a good one, um, you can see the, the, the kind of um, foundation was really laid during that early socialist period. Um, even though, of course, a lot of trial and error, a lot of mistakes, a lot of lessons. Mm -hmm. I mean, socialism doesn't come on a silver plate ready uh, with there was no roadmap uh, along the way. And for a country of that size, a country that poor, and that country that isolated from the global economy. So the fact that these kinds of achievements were made in the first three decades is something quite impressive that can't just be mm, erased, uh, I think, easily, or shouldn't be, at least. And, you know, one of the ways that people do try to um, erase that, right, is, and this is like in the West, uh, you often hear that, you know, Mao, just his policies killed millions of people. We hear a lot about the Great Leap Forward killing millions and the number for somehow seems to like rise every year or every few years, like some new book will be written and somehow five more million people are added to the toll of those who were killed. It just becomes more and more. But I guess my question to that would be, you know, this claim that's made by many critics of Mao and the Chinese system that Chinese agricultural policies uh, led to this massive famine in the years 1959 to 1961. Um, how do you respond to that? You talked a little bit about missteps. Um, and I think some people, and this is at least my take, is some people attribute, you know, that there isn't some roadmap written for socialism. Um, there are agricultural policies that are made that are actually could also be looked at as quite beneficial, but could also have some destructive consequences as well. But how would you respond to people who say that, oh, Mao's famines killed millions of people and therefore you should, you know, we have to discredit the entire uh, Chinese project? I mean... I mean, the, this is a, a good question. It's an important one in the in the sense that if you look at, um, I mean, the history of China is a history around against famine. When you look at mm -hmm. it, I mean, a highly agricultural agrarian society, feudal warlordism. It has been um, uh, living through you know all kinds of battles just to feed the people, and it's still today. That's why food the food security agenda is so high up. Uh, and the government's priorities. Um, but if you just even look at the modern period of China, you know, before the PRC came to rule, um, at all, especially during the uh, century of humiliation, it's just marked by many famines. Food, yeah. getting food to that large of a population has always been, even in my home province of Guangdong, like in the 1940s, we had, there were lots, tens of millions of people who died from famine. That's not a, a history to be proud of. But I think it helps you understand maybe the conditions of how difficult to feed hundreds of millions of people were in a country so poor and with such little uh, agricultural industrial development. So we have that, you know, obviously we have to look at those conditions. But also in this founding in 1949, you know, I mentioned like, you know, China already went on and took on imperialism, US imperialism, when they basically had no money and, you know, none of the, the military wherewithal to actually do that. Um, and so coming in the 50s period, this is a very poor country that's trying to transition into socialism. And in the first you know, five year plans, like a lot of socialist plan economies have, the priority was placed in industrializing economy uh, over the agriculture economy. Um, but the country was super weak. It was very weak, still within 10 years of creating in the 50s, like. That within 10 years of creating um, socialism or in the path to socialism. And I think one thing that's also worthwhile to note in terms of the real difficulties of developing agricultural production, the question of hunger, is that during this period is also when the Sino-Soviet split uh, was happening. And so, you know, in the late 50s till early 61, you actually had overnight thousands of experts, agricultural experts, industrial experts, hundreds of projects, development projects that stopped overnight. 
Soviet Union withdrew them all in a night. And of course, then the country had to go and repay its debt quickly. So there was a huge amount of conjuncture of factors um, that was at play that did um, have a uh, role in playing in terms of people being hungry and people starving in a history where this has been the history of my people has been dealing with how to feed that many people. There were also during the Great Leap Forward many kinds of questions, you know, around, okay, there were mid-level cadre that were not reporting the numbers that were right, they were exaggerated. There was corruption, the kinds of nuts and bolts of what makes actually um, any society or government. Um, um, so I think it's this conjuncture factor to understand what was happening in a country so poor, so young, very ill experience, very isolated from the world, trying to feed hundreds of millions of people. And those are some of the lessons learned and, and people have been, you know, and that's why I think understanding why the importance of writing poverty and why in that one of them is around not going hungry is such an essential <laughs> aspect of thinking about, um, because it's, it's a, it's a huge weight of a history of, of, I don't know, if you look just at the list of famines in the last few hundred years of Chinese history, it's something quite frightening, but quite real. And hasn't happened as much, obviously, like you mentioned, lessons learned. Um, so, that, I mean, that's a really interesting take on that. I, I also wanted to ask you um, about the year 1979, right? That's when China opened up and integrated into the global market. Um, I'm curious, you know, how would you see that as having impacted the country in poverty? You write in the report that the reform and opening up period is seen as a precondition for building a modern socialist country. And so I thought that was interesting because uh, some people, on particularly the Western left, uh, will say that 1979 was the year China ceased being a socialist country because it integrated into the global market. But of course, you say, that you. I thought it was interesting you described it as a precondition for building a modern socialist country. So from that perspective, can you elaborate? I mean, absolutely. I mean, at the point of, you know, uh, the, the Deng Xiaoping era, um, recognizing, I mean, the rapprochement with the U.S. and starting in 1972 with the Nixon visit is that China understood that its isolation from the, uh, the global economy, from being accessed the technology, the science, and the, uh, the capital that was necessary to actually develop the productive forces in a way that could meet the demands of actually the people of a country that big was urgent. Um, and so the opening up a reform period was seen as one stage in the sort of what's called the primary stage of socialism that China was still needed to overcome its uh, developmental um, um, backwardness, let's say. Um, so one thing I think it's important to recognize in terms of um, China didn't go become a capitalist country is that it wasn't all the sectors that were opened up to the market reform. Um, there was very much a, what's the policy of called keep the big, let go of the small, that's kind of a way to translate it. But basically the strategic industries still have always maintained in the hands of the state, in the, in the, under the control of the government as public state-owned enterprises. The smaller, less strategic ones were opened up to market forces to develop. And of course, the China, you know, the China that we see today when we look at the, I mean, I live in Shanghai and that kind of, it's a highly technological um, society, very advanced in many ways that came from that opening up to the West, uh, exchanges around education, uh, technology, science that was able to be able to use to help develop um, uh, China's economy, industry, science and tech. So of course, that was one of the ways that, that China made the assessment and in this process of modernization or towards building a, a modern, a socialist, modernist, modern society. But what's really important here, I mean, as we were talking about some of these, you know, juicy pieces of news we see every day, um, is that capitalists don't have political power. Ultimately, that's what's, I think, an important thing to remember is that there are very rich capitalists here. They have a lot of money, but they don't control political power. And we're seeing that exactly where, you know, we see, you know, um, you know, the Western pundits or people, China watchers getting very nervous about what is China doing with capital capital or what is China doing? <laughs> Billionaires is like ultimately saying, OK, the, the we know the government's in power under the direction of the CPC and that when it gets too far, we will reel it in. We will control it. 
Um, and we're seeing that in a huge way right now. So that's the kind of modernization, development of productive forces to a certain way, but also being able to say, this is not working. Um, things like education, the three mountains now are education, healthcare, and housing. And that's what we're gonna see in every one of these areas where those excesses can't be, can't be acceptable. I don't know. I mean, I think the American three mountains of like Pentagon, Pentagon and Pentagon <laughs> are way better than what you just described. No, it's it's so funny, though, because it's not just funny. It's, it's fascinating because China has managed to do this thing where it's like the capitalists in China do exist. But like you said, they don't have political power. It's the other way around. It's like the government is in charge of them. Whereas in the U S it's the complete opposite. The capitalists are in charge of the government and they dictate policy. Um, and I think this goes to the next question I wanted to, to ask you about, which is this, this ongoing debate. And again, I, I keep bringing it back to, I, I hate to center the Western left so much cause they really don't deserve to be so centered, but you know, the majority of our audience is of course American. Um, so in that sense, you know, it's important to, I think, engage in this argument because we often hear China's not a socialist country. China's a, a capitalist. Not only is China a capitalist country, China's a hyper-capitalist country. It's like the most capitalist you can get. I've actually heard this argument made on the Western left or in some segments of it. Um, so there's this debate, right, about whether is China a capitalist country or a socialist company, country. Like it has billionaires. It's integrated into the global market. And in many ways, it's essential, actually, to the global capitalist economy, right? But like we mentioned, it also has this centrally planned economy. So, you know, how would you define China's economy and I guess address these seeming contradictions? I mean, I think I don't have the definition for it, of course. Um, like I said, um, ultimately, um, China is socialism. I can't, it's not a sort of destination, ready-made destination that you just like, wake up overnight, we declare, we seize power, and therefore we're, yeah. we're a socialist country. I mean, yeah. it's this long process. And if you see, uh, I would say it's a country, socialist country in construction is very much the way I would frame it. Um, when we're looking at this, you know, new phase of under sort of modern prosperity or trying to what it, what understand what it means, or trying to figure out, um, uh, if we think that, you know, these three mountains, education, housing, and healthcare are the essential, these are kind of demands I think any socialist will, will support, you know, recognizing, yeah, that those are public goods and, uh, that should be made available to every single person on the planet. I mean, these are socialist demands, but the construction of it is actually a pretty, um, uh, I would say, a pretty complicated. I've heard Vijay Prasad, Prashad describe it this way, and I think he does a really good job of explaining, like, Socialism isn't easy. And I like that you said it's like China's socialism under construction because it's not it isn't like you just wake up one day and it's, it isn't in any of these countries. It's a very difficult, difficult process. It's not perfect. And human beings are in charge and human beings are imperfect and they make mistakes. And I do think it's kind of like funny that you have people in places like America. I mean, that's that's I keep bringing up the U.S. left because obviously that's the left I'm most familiar with. But like you have people who are on the Western left who are like willing to engage with like the Democratic Party, for example, which is like the most capitalist, one of the most capitalist entities in the world is the Democratic Party. But you're willing to engage with them sometimes for strategic purposes that do make sense. Yet all you can do, like all you ever do is criticize the missteps or what you think are mistakes of social of like socialists in the global south when like look at what you're doing like it's just it's it's this unbelievable contradiction and hypocrisy so i think the Absolutely. way absolutely i mean it's way bit way better to um criticize way easier to criticize socialism than actually trying to build it so i would challenge many of those who are <laughs> in that process of criticizing to actually engage in the process of building <laughs> right exactly exactly which we've continued to fail yeah. at in the u.s for decade after decade um but you know on on that note i want to kind of like broaden this the the topic out from just china for for a moment because Another constant criticism that we hear is that, you know, China's economic activities are broad or very malign. That's what the State Department will say. Um, and it's like, you know, the Chinese state is like going and, you know, putting these third world countries in debt traps. Um, 
And, you know, well, they'll, they'll claim that, you know, China is imposing these debt traps on Sri Lanka or Zambia. Um, and it's like a form of imperialism. That's what it, that's what they'll say. So how do you respond to those sorts of accusations that China's like going around the world to third world countries and like imposing its companies and projects through Belt and Road or whatever to trap these countries in debt so they can control them? I mean, I think one of the questions is around just looking at the history that I was talking about in the opening up of foreign period in China, you know, for countries of the global south that um, desperately need to seek development because, you know, people need roads, they need access to drinking water, they need electricity, they need um, uh, the kind of basic material conditions that they can live a, a, a good life or a decent life at least. So when you look, and I often talk to a lot of the comrades in um, Africa, and we, 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 as part of Dongsheng, one of the aspects that we focus on is around Africa-China relations. Mm -hmm. uh, and for anyone who wants to check it out at the Dongsheng website, you can. Um, it was a sort of weekly uh, digest that we were doing about some of these questions to try to, for us to understand better what's happening, which actually soon will become a podcast. So keep an eye on that Ooh. as a little plug. Exclusive, uh, announced first yeah. year. <laughs> um, but one of the questions is that, I mean, in a, con in, a, in a continent like Africa, where you have, you know, something like 40% of the continent without access to, um, you know, electricity, um, uh, let alone talk about access to, you know, internet uh, or 4G, 5G, 3G, or even 2G, um, yeah. the question of uh, bringing a China coming in and be able to offer financing, which is often at way better terms than uh, what will the Western, you know, the whatever, the, the Paris Club will provide uh, with much more negotiable, you know, uh, uh, terms. Like when we saw what COVID happened, when the, the DSSI came together and actually said, okay, China, you know, which, which debts are we actually going to, uh, either forego or delay uh, in terms of repayments for understanding that COVID hit many countries that were already struggling with many kinds of economic and social crises pre-existing to COVID actually experience. But at the same time, it's coming in and saying, okay, roads, bridges, electricity, um, internet. These are what countries negotiating and they're saying this is a better option and they're going to China to find a better option. So we have to actually see it not from a perspective only of China coming in and imposing and exploiting, but that there's actually states involved that come in and say, I want to have a choice about how we develop our future. And unfortunately, what the US has offered historically or what the global north has uh, offered to most of the global south has been uh, structural adjustment policies. It's about huge neoliberal agendas. It's around you know the, the, the uh, extraction and the plunder uh, through colonialism. Um, when you actually look at what the choices are, we have to look at also governments coming in saying, we we want roads and we, we like the deal that we're being presented. Yeah, I know it's it's complete projection. Like the whole idea of debt trap, what you just described from what the global North has been offering for decades, that that's been a debt trap. And that's why all these third world countries are like locked in this forever trap of paying back loans to like the World Bank and IMF from policies that destroyed their countries in the 90s. Um, but you know, I also, thought it was really interesting. Uh, I got to speak to the socialist candidate for president in Zambia, Fred Mbembe, who ultimately didn't end up winning. But it was still really interesting to get to interview him because I actually asked him, I posed this question to him uh, about the issue of like China, because we often hear with Zambia, China's doing this. And I thought it was interesting. One thing he said was like, one of the problems is that our country is run by a bunch of capitalists and they're the ones who make the deals with China. And so if there is an imbalance in the deals, it's because of the way our capitalists are making the deals um, with Chinese companies that Ch would never fly in China. Like China would never like, because China actually controls the capitalists in their country. If there's anything happening that's like exploitative, it wouldn't happen in China. It's happening in our countries because we're capitalist countries and that's who's in charge. And I just thought that was really interesting. But the other thing I would also add to that is like, from what you were saying with the deals are better with China, it's absolutely true because, you know, I live in Lebanon and a lot of the Middle East, uh, that a lot of Middle Eastern countries that are trying to kind of turn towards China, one of the reasons is because China doesn't impose conditions. Like the US, when they come in and do business or European 
uh, companies come in and do business, they impose these economic and political conditions on countries, whereas China just doesn't seem interested in meddling in that kind of way, <coughs> excuse me, um, which I think is, is really important. But <laughs> sorry, <laughs> as you explain um, in the report, you know, China's gone through these various stages of development, you know, beginning with the national liberation in the 40s and then overcoming the massacres by the Japanese, then stabilization, and then they needed to build this new society. And like you mentioned, you know, overcome famine and poverty. And now they find themselves in a new context with new objectives. You know, they expanded productive capacity, but then you mentioned in the report, like unbridled growth leads to problems and imbalances which is something that Xi Jinping has expressed that he wants to reduce these imbalances between rich and poor. So can you elaborate a little bit on what that means? I mean, now it just happened about a week ago. I mean, the idea of, you know, now it's kind of a buzzword of common prosperity actually emerged during the opening reform period. So during the Deng era was the idea, you know, many people might've heard this, I'll let a few get rich first. And mm -hmm. it, Oftentimes the kind of second part of that doesn't uh, get told, which is that, okay, the rich getting rich first have a responsibility to also help uplift uh, the re regions or the people that are lesser uh, or less rich. <laughs> that sounds funny because it's a translation and it's really hard to translate many things from Chinese and without making sounding ridiculous and Western media <laughs> loves doing that. Yeah. Uh, but putting in context is the idea like the East-West cooperation as an example, you know? There was a, okay, with the resources that there are and the strategic kind of development, okay, develop the Eastern area, industrialize the Eastern area. And now we are seeing in the poverty example is actually then there's a responsibility for then contributing back to the uplifting of, uh, uh, of less developed regions. Similarly, so this concept of common prosperity is this, you know, that if you get rich first, then, you know, the goal is or kind of a, a socialist goal is this common prosperity. So just uh, about a week or two ago, uh, President Xi came out and actually in a, in a meeting um, to talk about starting to outline what some of this is looking like. We don't have all the details, in, but what we're gonna be seeing is um, high levels of uh, reforms, uh, looking at, for instance, taxation. There's gonna be big questions about inheritance taxes, income taxes, especially for the ultra rich. Um, there's going to be all kinds of questions now of how uh, social welfare systems are provided and how they can be expanded, questions like pensions, uh, which is very severe right now because China is a, a rapidly aging society and, and this is um, something that is, is constantly uh, in, the, in the news and the debates here. Um, and then also this other side, the, the sort of third way, and that's also why we've been seeing all this, all these billionaires in the world is also looking at how to socialize some of the wealth of the billionaires, mm -hmm. mostly through donations. So, I mean, I mentioned Jack Ma and Alibaba. Just last week, he, uh, they came out and, and, and donated 15.5 billion US dollars Whoa. Uh, towards, a, uh, uh, towards a common prosperity fund. So these will be actually used to go back in to... Uh, education programs, it could be rural agricultural development, all kinds of things. But we're seeing one by one, these big tech coming out and actually contributing back. Of course, that's not going, that's just, that's a stopgap measure. It's not a, a, a kind of um, structural question, but there's all these aspects right now. And I think we're gonna see many changes about how does inequality get tackled um, and, and in various levels. So we seeing this sort of, um, sort of reeling in a uh, big tech uh, these reforms around education, healthcare, uh, housing, uh, as well as thinking about the social security uh, apparatus are big questions um, around all around the question of equality. It's so amazing because like what you're talking about sounds so great. And then I just think about the conversation among U.S. policymakers and it's like, it's like, can't the rich just pay like a tiny little wealth tax, like a teeny tiny one? And then you're talking about like giving $15 billion from like one person. It's Jesus. Um, so, you know, I, I, you mentioned this earlier and I wanted to touch on it again. I just have a few more questions for you. I know you've already given me a lot of your time, but this is an issue that doesn't get talked about enough. So I, I think now, since you wrote this report, it's so important to like pick your brain about it. But in the report, you mentioned – 
poverty as being more than just the way the U.S. measures it or that the World Bank measures it. Uh, and you mentioned how multi China took this like multidimensional approach where uh, which you also described in the beginning of our conversation, where they include things like access to electricity, food, clothing, medical services, housing. And I was just curious, you know, with this measurement of poverty, like, would that, if we actually took the way that China measures it and applied it to the rest of the world, where it's only just measured with the $1.90 a day um, line and then nothing else is looked into, if we took China's version of measuring poverty and applied that to the world, are we actually undercounting the amount of poverty that exists around the globe? I mean, I mean, obviously, I use the word multidimensional poverty, and that's actually something that was set out by um, the Amartya Sen, uh, Nobel laureate, and he was mm. one of the key thinkers around poverty and helped develop uh, the multi -po uh, multidimensional poverty index. China doesn't use the exact same one, but based on these principles of looking at some of the, the kind of social and material factors behind poverty, not just an income source. So according to the UN, the people who are living in multidimensional poverty is one, over 1 1.3 billion people. If we look at extreme poverty, I mean, remembering if we're going to use the sort of international standards of the UN, like the, the Sustainable Development Goals, by 2030, the goal was to actually eliminate poverty as one of the Sustainable Development Goals by 2030. What has happened, and of course exacerbated in the COVID moment, is just last year alone, we saw, you know, at least only looking at Saharan Africa and in South Asia, 71 million people who have fallen into extreme poverty. And it was the first year since 1998 um, that there was a global reversal in, uh, in poverty. So more people got poor as opposed to uh, slowly eradicating poverty. And so according to extreme poverty standards, uh, not the multidimensional with all the aspects of education, healthcare, housing, um, the number is actually expected to go uh, over 1 billion people by 2030. So instead of eradicating poverty, it's actually going to surpass 1 billion by the extreme uh, poverty level. So global poverty, I mean, is, is a huge issue of our times. So that for that reason alone, um, being able to study or at least be able to share some of the lessons and learnings from here is something I think all whether you're socialist or leftist or not, um, should be interested in. Anyone who cares about the future of humanity should be interested in. Yeah, and you know, it's like also it's, it's you know, China wasn't a European country that eradicated po extreme poverty. It was like we mentioned, it was a developing country that's done this. So it's actually become a real symbol for a lot of other developing countries of like, we want to emulate that. Um, which is, I think, is one of the reasons that China is such a, it's ideologically such a threat to the US at this point is because, it stands up as this like example of what a developing country can be. Um, that is like the antithesis to capitalism. Uh, but you know, so sp but speaking of like the the poverty rising in the global south, you know, at the same time as China has been so successful in eradicating it, um, given that the global south did see the opposite trend with poverty increasing, and that I know that could be also attributed to COVID. To what else do you attribute that? Like, why is that happening? I mean, well, one thing, I mean, when we look at the COVID moment is what is revealed is the his, is the, the recent three decades of neoliberal agenda that has actually just pillaged uh, and hollowed out the public sectors, you know, whether it's healthcare, which is the most obvious now under and the, still the growing pandemic year. Uh, and then uh, and all sectors across, you know, education, uh, housing and 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 and. Uh, these factors have actually really um, prevented the uh, people from being able to um, meet the most basic uh, necessities. Of course, then the grow growing unemployment, but we, the, the neoliberal hauling out in this particular moment of the capitalist agenda has, has created devastation for the world's poor, particularly in the global south. Um, and so, I mean, whether it's that or also even just looking at the response to the pandemic, uh, look at it, it's a test of the the strength of the public institutions be able to respond how quickly uh, how efficiently and and you know the country I was living uh, before I, I came here at the end of the COVID was in Brazil you know where it reached levels of having 
similar to US of over 5,000 deaths a day. I mean, that's in one day was the amount of how many people in a country of 1.4 billion actually died in the whole duration of pandemic here in China. One day with over a year and a half of the experience. So these these are, you know, um, these are kind of the tests of the 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 strength of its uh, you know public capacity, its institutions, and it's no doubt that obviously the the many of the socialist countries or the socialist countries in construction, whether it's from Cuba to Vietnam to China to or even communist-run states like Kerala and India, have fared way better uh, in this mm -hmm. response. Yeah, and actually, that was like the last thing I really wanted to ask you about was going to the issue of COVID-19 and the response to the pandemic, I'm curious if like you could draw a line almost or, or, or a thread uh, between China's poverty alleviation program and the way it was able to kind of get all these people on board for this process, like across the country, across geographic locations. If having that infrastructure in place was able to help at all with the government's ability re to respond to COVID-19. Yeah, I mean, I think that's really important. Uh, you, you mentioned that, you know, the, the CPC is over 95 million members, um, but also including with that, it's, you know, thousands, if not about 5,000 uh, organizations uh, at pretty, pretty much every level sector of society to the most kind of grassroots community level. And at the COVID, a moment it was really based on the community groups not only uh, uh professionals but actually community groups that were already organized to do temperature testing to help mm -hmm. uh uh check you know the door-to-door -door knocking to figure out you know to administer the tests and so it was that this kind of infrastructure was mobilized in these kinds of moments and you would see the kind of fight against covid and the fight against poverty happening in the same year they're able to kind of control both these things the same year is actually um a kind of say a testament to how that infrastructure works. But I think with that, I think another parallel is not like not dissimilar to, you know, the sending of the cadre to the communities for poverty alleviation is also sending the cadres, whether they're doctors, medical professionals, or even delivery workers to be able to control the COVID situation. So as a result, I think one thing that if you it's if you read any of the Western news, it almost feels like an any day now the CPC will fall because the people <laughs> will like rise up and like just, just it'll just fall. But people yeah. forget that it's a widely, wildly popular in the sense of like publicly supported or party, you know? And it has actually only increased due to both um, many factors, but uh, the COVID has, the, the, the fight against COVID has also uh, increased uh, the kind of public approval and perception. And actually it was last year, it was Harvard University that did a, um, a study looking at the CPC's approval ratings uh, between 2003, 2016, doing um, a mass survey, many, many, you know, at every level from the village to all the way to the kind of national level. And the, the, the support for this party has actually increased from 86%, which is like really high, mm -hmm. all the way to 93%. Uh, this is Harvard talking about it. And of course, mm -hmm. they credit to various things. It's about, okay, the more the responsiveness of local governance uh, and, and officials and leaders. It's around the, you know, battle against corruption. It's around, which is very severe here and take it really seriously up to the top, top levels of government. Um, it's looking at the provision of, of more services in the regions. And now after uh, COVID, the numbers have actually just increased like there is a pretty high morale and confidence in the and the government's ability to to i guess provide for the vast majority of its people uh, and so that sometimes i feel like that voice never comes out as if you know the, the will of like the mass of the people here doesn't matter it's <laughs> but actually <laughs> that comes from the, the 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 practice and what what the government has actually been able to show to the people when it comes to COVID and poverty, these have been huge um, boosts in the public morale. And it makes complete sense. I mean, and I, I actually kind of wanted to ask you, this is not really related to the poverty alleviation program. It's more about just on a societal level. Um, is China having any of the same 
I had issues that we see in the US right now. Like when I watch the conversation in the US around COVID, it's an extreme amount of distrust of the government, um, which is for good reason. I mean, people, people distrust the US government. It's like on an instinctual level, they're right to, but then they end up of conflating that with like public health officials. And so then they become distrustful of like what the government's doing in response to COVID or saying you should do in response to COVID. And so people don't trust vaccines and there's all this vaccine hesitancy as a result. And people are like distrustful of mask mandates and like of lockdowns and of like literally the state doing anything during a public health emergency. Whereas China doesn't seem to have that problem. And I wonder if it's because of that level of trust. And then also the, the policies that China implemented actually seem to have worked. Like, are you living a relatively normal life there? I I pandemic mean, wise. I mean, yeah, I, I think, I mean, Shanghai was never a place that was very hard hit, but I'll give you just a more anecdotal um, kind of uh, portrayal of it is that, you know, when I still go into the, the metro or the subway um, or take a taxi or go to, you know, busy public spaces, everyone still wears masks, even though it's been, I don't know, over a year since we've seen cases. Um, it's not a thing that it's in the reality, but it's like, this is also, I think there are aspects of our own. So the, the collectivity in the culture here that is very different from a kind of more individualistic society like we see in the West. So, yeah. you know, even pre-COVID, if, if you have a cold, you wear a mask because the idea is not just about you protecting yourself, um, but it's actually protecting the others around you. Um, and those who share, uh, you know, train cars, you know, like, in the, yeah, it's not a kind of imposition. So obviously, I mean, it's a country of 1.4 billion. Are there disagreements? Are there mistrust? Are there kind of many doubts and many debates? Of course there is. And that's one thing I think people don't get a sense of is actually how lively the that sort of debate space can be uh, around these questions. But at the same time, there's just no doubt you go, you go into uh, a subway, everyone's just wearing a mask. That's not even a discussion point. <laughs> and in terms of vaccine, maybe hesitancy, I mean, China now up until this point, last time I checked, is, has administered over 2 billion doses. Of course, it's a place that has the you know least amount of cases. And so some of the ha vaccine hesitancy, even talking to friends or other people, would have just been feeling like they don't need it because it's not a, the virus is not around. So yeah. less than like this sort of more anti-scientific, you know, yeah. mistrust of vaccines. That's not, that's not, would not be a, a common view here at all. People are pretty trusting of science and, and the, the, the medical system. Yeah. And I think that that's probably, I think you really hit the nail on the head too, with the issue of like individualism versus collectivism. Cause I think that's another really big issue we have in the U S is the, in the West in general, but specifically in the U S is this like very, like libertarian strain of thinking that like you almost can't escape it. If you are born and raised in America, you're sort of like inculcated with this sort of individualism. Even if you're a socialist, you can't help it sometimes. Like it's just, and any, anything that like sounds like a mandate, a vaccine mandate, a mask mandate feels like some sort of imposition on your personal freedoms. And that's the first thing that comes to mind as opposed to like, oh, I just don't want to get other people sick, <laughs> you know? And so, yeah, I guess it doesn't sound like you guys have that conversation or that debate or that problem in China, but I guess a lot of countries don't really have that problem. <laughs> I mean, the thing is, it's interesting. I, and back in November, so um, like 10 months ago, I went back to Brazil and I, um, you know, I got all the vaccines and the paper. I mean, I'm used to it here, everywhere you have a you know green health code, obviously. Have I com ever complained about it? Probably just be like, oh, bummer, you know. <laughs> it's annoying. But at the same time, yeah. it's just like, and but the moment that you don't feel it anymore, and you don't, you know, you don't feel like you're being taken care of, like in a kind of, you know, the state is not taking care of you. <laughs> but I, but going to Brazil was that. I arrived, and I'm just sort of like, there's these really cute videos uh, here of like kids that got trained to like just stick their hand out and just like get their temperature tested, you know, like little babies. Going. <laughs> so I just felt like I was going around like trying to get someone and to take my people were like, what do you want? What do you want a I bracelet? Like, what do you want? National <laughs> airport. I didn't get, I didn't get tested. I didn't, I didn't get tested. Not even for obviously none of the COVID tests, but not even, you know, temperature checks. It just came from an international travel. It took it's days crazy. before the first person took my temperature. The bars were filled with people without masks, you know, there were yeah. water parks filled with people bringing their kids and there were thousands of people dying each day. 
So yeah. for me in that moment, I was like, okay, the the freedom that I'm feeling like I'm lacking is actually that my well-being is cared for. It's not just downloaded on the individual to feel like, hmm, how much do I feel like protecting my lives or the lives of other people around me? It's not just my individual choice. And I, I felt it once I left China and remembered what a lot of the world feels and looks like and just, okay, I actually do want to get tested and I, I do want to be able to get my temperature checked and I, I do want to you know, have my green code that tracks where I go if I'm going to high risk areas or not, and that people know where I've been. Uh, yeah. So if I it ever get the sense. virus, they can track it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it makes perfect sense. I mean, the closest I've been to that is I, I was recently in Italy uh, and in Rome, and like they actually have that green pass system um, where they check like it, it, you either have to have like a, a vaccine card, or I don't think it's quite as high tech as China, it's just a vaccine card or a negative COVID test within for the last 48 hours, or proof that you had a positive COVID test in the last six months. Which sounds great, actually. I was very happy about that. The only thing was like, they didn't ask for my ID. So I literally could have just showed them like anyone's pass or a fake pass and nobody would have said anything. So like, it's not even being implemented the way it should be, like in an effective way. Um, but also, yeah, I didn't feel like my personal freedom was being violated. So I just look at these conversations in America and I'm like, why are people like having a meltdown because they maybe can't get into a restaurant without being vaccinated? <laughs> it's just bizarre. So I actually appreciate the way you just explained that. Um, on that note, can you tell people where they can find your work? Sure. I mean, I think two ways to follow the, um, if you want to read the, the study that you've helped us plug is at the tricontinental.org. And it's available in English, Spanish, Portuguese, and I think it'll be in Hindi soon. Um, yeah, and then if anyone wants to follow um, more news about China, um, uh, you can go to dongshengnews.org. It's basically a place where we collect um, articles from China, but also from you know Western media, but trying to kind of put it in a package where it's a daily, you know, weekly digest. Uh, of 10 stories that help you get the pulse of what's happening in China, uh, what are some of the debates happening in China. So um, I encourage people to check it out. Yeah, thank you so much. And I'll link to those uh, in the YouTube description. I really appreciate you coming on and talking to me for so long about this particular issue. It's so important. Um, and hopefully we can have you back on soon to talk about other China-related issues. It was a big pleasure. Thank you, Rania.